Hashtag blessed. Probably the most used hashtag on the internet. <laughs> I just checked uh, five minutes ago. Currently, right now, there's 138 uses, 138 million uses of the hashtag blessed on Instagram alone. I don't even know on Twitter how many that would be. Hashtag blessed is one of the most used hashtags on the internet, and actually, in the text that we're going to examine over the next few weeks, the word bless is the most commonly used word in the Beatitudes, which is actually how it derives its name. It's a Latin usage of the word blessed, Beatitudes, to be blessed. And as we examine the blessings of the Beatitudes, what we're going to begin to see is that they may seem cute and pithy and, under, and, and, and just um, quaint on the surface. There is a depth of meaning that is absolutely beautiful. Um, And so, hashtag blessed, we are excited for the next nine weeks to understand the blessings of the Beatitudes. Now, before we get into that, I just want to quickly illustrate something. The, The origins of stained glass are not quite certain. There's a bunch of different renditions of what the history of stained glass looks like. But it is certain that ancient Egyptians were the ones who discovered glass. Uh, And as they began to figure out how to use glass, and over the centuries, people have discovered how to make beautiful stained glass, um, and stained glass windows, and stained glass art. And in fact, one of the shows that my wife and I really like watching is a show called Blown Away, uh, where master glass blowers depict these beautiful colored glass sculptures and the chance to win $60,000 just through this um, amazing competition. And and so the art and the history of stained glass windows and stained glass architecture and stained glass sculpturing is very beautiful and very rich. But here's the thing. The purpose of most windows, the purpose of most windows is to allow light in and to light up or, or be, able to be able to see outside, to light up something inside or to be able to illuminate what's going on outside. However, the purpose of stained glass windows is not ex- actually to be able to help you see what's outside, but really to beautify a building and to allow light in in a particular way and in many cases to tell a story. And as we dive into one of Jesus' most famous sermons he ever preached, we're given something that's a lot like a stained glass window. These Beatitudes, as we read through them, they are not separate cute little statements meant to be just kind of digested separately on their own. They're actually so much more than that. They're they're, they're more than just little hashtags to be used. They're more than just little things to be hung on a frame individually isolated from the rest of the Beatitudes. They're actually powerful truths that describe the culture and the characteristics of people in God's kingdom. And while each one of these blessings is rich and profound and beautiful by itself, and we're going to devote an entire message to each one of them over the next nine weeks, collectively what they begin to do is display something, tell a story about something that is much more rich and profound as all of the individual parts are put together. So like a stained glass window, each one of them gives us a view of the world that is, that is particularly shaded a, a certain way that would give you a view of the world that's different from what you were normally used to. But then as you begin to step back and see them all put together, 
what they begin to do is actually reveal something profound. They begin to tell a story and reveal a particular character that dominates the scene of these all together. And what we see in the Beatitudes, what we see in the beginning of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, is actually a wonderfully beautiful picture of God's heart. And we're shown the greatest picture of God, which is Jesus himself. So as we approach the text of this message, Jesus is about to shift the paradigm of how people saw their world and also how people saw God. In fact, each one of us even today, you, me, every single person here, everybody watching online, you all have a view, one particular view of the world, the way that you see the world, your lens. And if you're being honest, you also have a particular way that you view God. Now, it might have been shaped by a lot of things. It might have been shaped by the trials that you grew up with. Right? It might have been shaped by the faith that was handed down to you that now you're trying to go, what do I do with this? It, it might be a particular view that's just due to the fact that you just started following Jesus and now I don't know how this mindset of the kingdom of God matches up with this whole world that I've actually lived with for all my life. Or maybe it has something to do with the influences that you've had on the internet and that has a big part of how you view this world and how you view God. And in this message that Jesus preaches, he's bringing a paradigm shift to see the world in a totally different way. And in fact, the words that Jesus uses in this particular message, in the Sermon on the Mount, in my prayer for my sermon today in this series. The words that Jesus uses, they, they comfort the afflicted, but they also afflict the comfortable. So just a, just a Surgeon General's warning. That's what you can expect. That there's a paradigm shift that's happening in the words of Jesus that just blow apart the way that people viewed the world. And so, in order to appreciate what Jesus is uh, speaking to, I mean, we're going to read the text together in just a moment, but I want to give you a little bit of context. And in order to understand that, I'm going to back up into the end of chapter 4. So if you have a Bible, Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, is where I'm going to give a little bit of context before I get into the text of Matthew 5. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, I'm just going to read through the end, says, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the good news of the kingdom, which, by the way, is an incredibly significant theme in the entire book of Matthew. It's what Jesus has been teaching about up until this point, and will continue to do so. And this is how Matthew describes the, the ministry and the impact and the power and the person of Jesus Christ. is through the lens of God's kingdom that's coming here on earth. Jesus is preaching the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness among the people. And news about him spread all over Syria. And people were brought to him, all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed. Can you imagine if we had a church where people felt free to bring the demon-possessed because they would meet Jesus? Those with seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. In large crowds from Galilee and Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and the regions across the Jordan followed him. Now when he saw those crowds, this is Matthew 5 verse 1. When he saw those crowds, he went up to a mountainside and he sat down and his disciples came to him. So the question right here is, who are the disciples? And if you're not thinking too much about it, you might say the 12 disciples. And that's not who actually this is referring to, at least not entirely, because the 12 disciples had not been fully formed until chapter 10, okay? So, so we're not there yet. There are probably a few of them with him right now, but this is not referring to the 12 disciples. Who is he referring to? I think 
it can be understood that Jesus is referring to the people who had been following him, the people who had been learning from him, his disciples, those following him in his footsteps. So, so at the very least, he's referring to a, a crowd of people who had been following him from place to place. At the most, he's referring to everybody in this crowd right now. His disciples came to him. And this is, this is the people that make up the beginning parts of Jesus' early ministry. People who had been following him around, listening to him teach on the kingdom of God. And who were they? They, they were loads of people, primarily lower class day laborers, like, like fishermen. They were people who lived in the slums. They were people who were sick and diseased and demon possessed and epileptic and paralyzed, etc. So what does Jesus say to this crowd of unimportant people in their society? People who were sick and marginalized and, and not very influential. And frankly, intentionally avoided. What does Jesus say to people like this? He says these nine blessings. And in that audience, words like this are electric. They, they had never heard anything like this. You and me, most people in, in our country, most people who sit in most churches today, have decades of familiarity with the Beatitudes. There's books written on it. There's sermons preached on it. Most people have decades of familiarity with what is called the Beatitudes, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. These people had never heard these words before. They had never heard a message like this to them before. And so everyone's hearing this fresh. For the first time, the good news of the kingdom is landing on their ears in a totally new way. And this is what Jesus says. You can go ahead and stand with me. We're going to read one verse together. It's a big challenge. Um, Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Here we go. This is what Jesus says. He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray that as we dive into your word this morning, please illuminate your eternal word into our hearts. I pray that for those who have come weary today, who have come exhausted today, who have come just at the end of themselves, I pray that you would comfort them. That you would open their eyes to see the kingdom that is offered. The kingdom of heaven. And those... For those, Lord, who have come today who are full of themselves, who are just checking a religious box off their list, God, I pray that you would, that you would be as Spurgeon says, the hound of heaven, not letting up on the door of their heart, that in your grace you would not give up on trying to get their attention. I fully re recognize in this church and churches across our country, God, there are people who think that they are in just because they look the part. And I pray, Lord, that you would open their eyes today to the kingdom of heaven that is available. God, please speak individually, appropriately to our hearts, to what we need. God, soften our hearts, challenge our hearts, convict our hearts, dissect our hearts in the way that only your word can. And I pray, God, that you would speak through my human and imperfect lips. Please bring a message of hope and life and redemption. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. On the surface of this statement, and all, really the eight statements that follow this in the, in the Beatitudes, they seem very understandable. The question is not, what does Jesus mean in a grammatical sense? Because it's pretty easy to understand. In fact, that's not even what I'm going to try to get into because we could have just spent five minutes on that and be gone. The question more appropriately asked is, what does Jesus mean with these words to this particular audience at this particular time? Why is Jesus saying these blessings, specifically this first one? And so to understand the answer to that question, I think what we need to do is look at a few words and phrases to really unpack the depth of what that looks like. The first one I want to start with is the word blessed. It's the word blessed, which he uses uh, a bunch of times here. 
It's the word blessed, and um, it actually comes from the Greek word, which is the Greek word makarios. Makarios. Okay? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, if you're anything like me, you've probably heard somebody say you could easily swap uh, the word happy in for the word blessed. And though that is certainly one of the translations of makarios, I think it's actually a disservice to this text to make a simple swap like that. Um, those who are blessed will generally be profoundly happy. But blessedness, especially in this sense that Jesus is talking about, can't actually be reduced to just happiness. Okay? That's, that's a, a, a lazy substitution right there. Throughout the Bible, what we actually see is a fuller sense of how the word blessed is really used. Even in a Jewish scholarly sense, even in a biblical sense, in an Old Testament sense, the Jews of Jesus' day actually had a paradigm for, for how this word blessed was taught and was used um, in, in Jewish teachings and in biblical teachings. Jesus is not actually the first teacher to pronounce blessings like this. This, was a, this, this style of sermon was actually common. In fact, it's in a biblical sense, you look back into uh, Psalm 1, the very first psalm. This is, this is the paradigm of how blessings were given. Psalm 1. Oh, there goes notes from a different message. Always got to be ready to preach, you know? <laughs> Literally, it's a different sermon. Um, blessed, is, <laughs> blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. Look at Psalm 119, the longest, the longest psalm in the Bible, the longest discourse in the Bible. Psalm 119 starts like this, very similar way. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. This, this is a very common, and there's, there's lots more here in, in the psalms and in Old Testament literature, but there's, there's a paradigm here for blessing sermons, blessing literature. Additionally, if you follow the course of Jewish history and Jewish scholarship and Jewish teachers, there was a paradigm also just of how sermons like this would have been preached. So, for example, there was an um, early Jewish sect called the Essenes. They're the people who preserved the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they actually had a very high view of their strict, rigid way of living and following Old Testament law. Right? They're actually fairly proud of how good they were at that. And so what they did, beyond just preserving the Dead Sea Scrolls, is they wrote literature on how to live rigid, devoted lives to Yahweh, like they were doing. And one of those uh, works was called the, wisdom, uh, the, the Scroll of Wisdom. And so it, one of the things in the Scroll of Wisdom, it reads like this. Blessed is the one with a pure heart who does not slander with his tongue. Blessed are those who adhere to the commands of Torah and do not... Uh, adhere to perverted paths. Blessed are those who rejoice in wisdom, who do not run into paths of folly. Blessed are those who search for wisdom with pure hands and do not pursue her with a treacherous heart. Blessed is the man who attains wisdom and walks in the law of the Most High, implied like we do. And then, this is really interesting, 150 years before Jesus, there was another guy named Jesus who also pronounced nine blessings. His name was Jesus ben Sirah, and he was a Jewish scholar, Jewish teacher, and he he wrote a, a work called The Wisdom of Ben Sira. And, and this actually became fairly popular in that intertestamental period. Between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's about 450 years. Um, during that period of time, Jesus Ben Sira became a prominent teacher. And in The Wisdom of Ben Sira, that was a work of his, he writes these nine blessings. He says, These are nine whom I would call blessed, and a tenth my tongue proclaims. Blessed is the one who can rejoice in his children. Blessed is the one is the man who lives to see the downfall of his foes. Blessed is the one who does not sin with the tongue. Blessed is the one who does not serve an inferior. Blessed is the one who finds a friend. Blessed is the one who speaks to attentive listeners, because he's important enough to be listened to, right? Greatest is the one who finds wisdom, and none is superior to the one who fears the Lord. Now notice this. It sounds kind of biblical. It sounds like, oh man, that, that might have come from the Bible. Until you begin to realize that he's only pronouncing blessings on those for whom... Life is going very well, right? He's popular. He finds friends. He is not an inferior to anybody. 
right? He's got power. He speaks to a ten of listeners. He's got influence. People want to listen to him. And what you begin to notice is actually, over time, this style of preaching, of pronouncing blessings, actually has become, up until Jesus' point of, uh, of, of speaking, has actually become something that is overwhelmingly preached to those who are healthy, wealthy, and wise. God's blessing is on you. You want to know who God blesses? Look at all the people whose lives are going well. Which for Jesus' particular audience in Matthew 5 is a message of shame. It's a message of condemnation. Your life isn't going well? Well, you must not be good with God. It must be your fault that you're poor. Go out and get a job. It must be your fault that you have an injury, you have an illness, you have a sickness. You shouldn't have been so selfish. It must be your fault that you're demon-possessed. You must not have gone to temple enough. And so for these people whom the tragedies of life has befallen on, there's not a message of hope in Judaism. There's not a message of hope that's been preached to them. And Jesus steps up and says, blessed are the, and there's a paradigm that happens in their brain, right? That's, that's, that's queued up in their brain. They already have a way of hearing this like, okay, here we go. This isn't for me. Or it is, but I'm just not good enough. And Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It, it's it's mind-blowing. He is affirming every one of their difficult life situations. He says, you are the people that God is favoring, that God is approving of, because the kingdom of heaven is offered to you first. This is, this is, this is shattering to their paradigm. The other thing that you need to notice is, not only does he say the kingdom of heaven is offered to you, Right here. He says it again. If you notice, right at the end of these phrases. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for yours is the, the kingdom of heaven is yours. He additionally says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now the question is, did Jesus just run out of blessings to pronounce? Like, oh no, I only had eight. I guess I'll have to fill in with this ninth one, uh, the one I did in the beginning. Well, I guess I'll change subjects now. <laughs> You're the salt of the earth. Is that what's happening here? Did Jesus just run out of content or material? Well, no. What you're actually encountering here, and this is a Bible study tip I want to give you, okay? This is, you can notice this in loads of passages in Scripture when you're reading your own Bible. When you notice a passage that begins and ends with the same expression or a parallel expression, what you've actually encountered is a stylistic device called an inclusio. An inclusio is actually... Uh, when everything bracketed in between these two parallel statements um, is included under the same theme as those two statements. Okay? This is an intentional expression by biblical writers. In fact, there's loads of biblical writers who are famous for doing this. I don't have time to get into it, but David, Solomon, Paul, they all do this in their writings. This thing called an inclusio, where they will say a list of things, and they'll, at the beginning at the end, it's very similar to each other. Meaning, everything in between is influenced by the theme of the two bracketing statements. So when you're reading your Bible, you can notice this and know, specifically in this case, everything Jesus is saying here, let me, let me give it to you plain, is about the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you for when you are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Everything in between is about the kingdom of heaven. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is what people in the kingdom of heaven will be like. This is the blessing of the kingdom of heaven. Not the blessing of the kingdom of earth. Right? This is an intentional thing that Jesus is doing here. So it's important to notice what he's saying when he's pronouncing these nine blessings. There's a layer of meaning that's actually uh, deeper than what's just noticeable on the surface. And I love this because Jesus says this is the blessing for those who are like this. Not try to be like this so that you'll get the blessing. 
That's a big difference. Okay, there's a lot of preachers who are going to go out and say, like, here's how you become poor in spirit. Here's how you become persecuted. <laughs> not a good sermon. Therefore, you can get this blessing. That's not what Jesus is saying here. In fact, there's a wonderful Bible scholar named Stanley Howard Voss. I really like how he says it. He says, too often those characteristics are turned of the Beatitudes are turned into ideals that we must strive to attain. As ideals, they can become formulas for power rather than descriptions of the kind of people to whom Christ first brought the kingdom of God. Nowhere does Jesus tell us we should try to be poor in spirit or mourn all the time or try to get yourself persecuted. He simply announces the great surprise that these people who were not significant or honored in their society are precisely the ones who have received the honor to be called into God's kingdom. The blessing just is for those who are already that way. And specifically in our text this morning, are what way? Poor in spirit. The blessing is for those who are poor in spirit. Now does he mean economically poor? Does he mean spiritually poor? Yes. Especially in his society, there was a very tightly knit blend between the two realities of your economy and your spirituality. Right? When you're living in a theocracy, when you're living in a, a society where your law keepers are actually religious leaders, then everything about your life is wrapped into your religious experience. So Jesus is saying to you, People in front of me who are poor, poor in spirit, you're spiritually poor, your spirit feels downtrodden, you're economically poor, this is the blessing. These are the ones who have nothing and feel like nothing. These are the ones who don't seem to experience much progress or power. They're the ones on the outside of everything that's going on. And so he's, the idea here is that poverty of spirit is this acknowledgement of spiritual bankruptcy, um, it's the conscious confession of my unworth before God. Now, it's not surprising then that the kingdom belongs to the poor in spirit. Here's why. At the very outset of the Sermon on the Mount, we learn we don't actually have the capacity to live up to anything Jesus is preaching here. He's going to end on this crescendo of be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. How do I do that? I can't. We cannot fulfill God's standards and we have to come to him and acknowledge our spiritual bankruptcy. Emptying ourselves of our own idea of self-righteousness. And when we are finally emptied, that we, we are in poverty of spirit. That is when we are ready for him to fill us again. Um, one of the things I remember studying when I was in seminary, and I love studying this, was the, the Welsh Revival of 1904. Fascinating study about a particular revival, but it, revivals in general, I love studying the history of revivals throughout the church. Um, and they, they take different shapes in different places, at different times, with different kinds of people in different cultures and different languages. But one of the dominating themes that is true throughout every single revival one of the things that will be true of any revival that's ever happened or that ever will happen is that they didn't start at a huge conference or seminar. They didn't put revival on the calendar and then all of a sudden Jesus showed up. It started with individual people who recognized the poverty of their own spirit and they cried out to God in total desperation and surrendered their life. They submitted the rest of their life to God's ways. And when that happened, the Holy Spirit came in to their life and in that particular location and just began to transform one life after another. Life after life after life. Ground zero for any revival is the personal admission of spiritual poverty. You want to see revival in this time? You want to see the church break the chains 
of what feels like limitation. You want to see the church explode and Jesus' name become famous? It starts when you realize how, poverty, how poor in spirit you are. It starts with your own humility. Ground zero for every revival is the personal admission of spiritual poverty. And this is what the devil is trying so hard to prevent in our time. He wants you to think that you don't really need God Monday through Saturday. And frankly, you don't really need God that much on Sunday either. And Jesus is saying, contrary to what the enemy or your society wants you to believe, the poor in spirit are actually in a very favorable position to be found in. They are the ones that are the emptiest, the most open-minded, and the most ready to admit their own spiritual poverty. They're, they're the most ready to reach out their arms and receive help from outside of themselves from one who can help, namely Jesus. Right? They're blessed because they're precisely in the very position that would motivate them to open their arms to the only one who can help them. They're not trying to figure it out on their own. It's often the people with the most to lose that are the least likely to open their arms to Jesus. It's the ones with the least to lose who are more open to Jesus. People who have the most to lose have to consider following Jesus in terms of what is it going to mean to my financial situation? What is it going to mean to my particular identity in this society? I, ha I feel like I have so much to lose. And though it's not impossible, it is often so much harder for those with so much to lose, to say, I surrender to the one who died on the cross. They have a lot to lose. It's so much harder. And Jesus is highlighting the fact that it is precisely those most ready to be humble. Those with poverty of spirit. Those open to outside help. To whom the kingdom of heaven is offered first. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's about to sting, but I think confession's good for the soul. Let me ask you a, que a couple questions. Did you come to church today because you wanted to or because you needed to? What is falling apart more? Your Bible or you? For you, is prayer a regular routine or an occasional option? Are other people, other human beings made in God's image, are they opportunities to serve or obstacles in your way? Like when you drive home, are you going to get upset if someone's slow in front of you? Do you have a burning desire to share the good news of Jesus because of how awesome it is and how much it's changed your life? Or is sharing the gospel something that sounds a lot more like a chore? When do you find yourself lost in worship and in total awe of God? All the time or just when someone else brings your attention to it? See, depending on the answer, for many of us, it's possible you have a higher view of yourself and a lower view of God and others, or at least lower than yourself. And that you don't actually think you need God's grace very much in your life. And Jesus is saying that one of the barriers, one of the greatest barriers to the kingdom of heaven is a high and lofty view of yourself. It's being convinced that you're actually doing okay, that you don't actually need God's redeeming grace that much. You're not poor in spirit. This is a big deal. This is a very big deal because God opens heaven's door to those who are spiritually poor. That is to whom the kingdom is offered. God opens heaven's door to those who are spiritually poor. This is, this is the fundamentally the point that Jesus is making. He's proclaiming a blessing on those who are absolutely devoid of wealth in their own spirit. Many people probably think they have a wealth of soul satisfaction, but the poor in spirit don't. The poor in spirit are very ready to admit their own depravity. Their own utter sinfulness, bankruptcy before God. Now, what's the big deal about knowing and admitting my own depravity? Why 
is it such a big deal to be conscious of the consequence of my sinfulness and the helplessness that I have to atone? Why does it matter so much that, that I'm spiritually bankrupt? Here's why it matters so much. The God we worship, the God that's revealed to us in the Bible, is absolutely holy and absolutely sovereign. And, and even though Jesus is eventually going to say in this sermon, be holy as your Father in heaven is holy, be perfect like he's perfect, not a single one of us has the level of holiness like God does that cannot even stand the presence of sin. No one here has that kind of holiness. God is, is absolutely transcendent above us in every way in terms of his holiness and his sovereignty. He is pure and, and his holiness is splendor, splendid and, and perfect and just. And then you look at us and we are sinful. And here's the deal. The nature of sin at its core, the nature of my sin is that in my sinfulness, I desire God's throne. Everything I do that is called sin comes from the heart desire to be God. And this is, at its core, rivalry with God. It's an offense to the holiness and sovereignty of God. And so when a sinful human dares to approach God's presence, here's the thing. There is no chance of survival for this sinful human being. When I dare to approach God's presence until the sin has been paid for. And how does that look? A just, fair, appropriate consequence is carried out against the person on whom the sin record rests. That's how sin is paid for, is you, with the sin record, pay for your sin. That's, that's, that's what fair is. I used to say when I was a kid, Dad, that's not fair. He's like, you don't want fair. I'd be like, why? Yeah, I do. He's like, it's called hell. And I'm like, oh, I'm done with this conversation. <laughs> wow, Jesus juked me right there. But it's, it's true in the sense that fair is you pay for your sin. Now, in a limited thought process, some people might want to say, oh, God just overlooks my sin. He kind of looks the other way. He excuses me. It's okay. We're good. But if God is actually fair, if he's actually just and eternally holy, he cannot overlook sin. Please don't miss this. That God cannot just pretend sin does not exist. He has to justly and appropriately condemn it to the point that the holiness of God is satisfied. That it is paid in full. So what is a just and appropriate consequence for sin? Well, it actually depends on who you're sinning against. What is a just and appropriate consequence for sin committed against an infinitely holy God? It's an infinitely just punishment. Hell. Let me ask you one final question. Can a finite human ever pay back an infinite debt? Even if he's paying it for all of eternity. No. Because there will always be a day in your future that you have to pay more. You can't possibly pay an infinite debt. You're beginning to feel the weight of your spiritual poverty. If God is only just, every single one of us is in big trouble. Your sin and my sin, as inconsequential as we may want to claim it is, has incurred an infinite debt. And because it was committed against an infinitely holy God, finite you and finite me stand absolutely no chance of ever being able to pay it in full. And this is what Jesus is driving at right off the bat. 
kingdom of God is available to those who are poor in spirit. Now, this is crazy. Why would Jesus claim that the kingdom belongs to, is even offered to, those who are the absolute most aware of the fact that they could never get into the kingdom? Why is the kingdom offered to the poor in spirit? Well, let me ask you this way. If you were in a mess that you had absolutely no way of getting out of, what would you do? What does someone do when they face a problem they could never solve in a million years? They cry out for help. They cry out for help. The reason Jesus claims that the kingdom is offered to the poor in spirit is because it's precisely these people who know they stand no chance to ever repay the infinite death, the debt that they have occurred against God to escape God's wrath against their sin, that they, can, they have no right to enter God's presence and that they desperately need someone to come in and save them. It is not the high and lofty of spirit who enter the kingdom. Why? Because they don't actually think they need a savior. It's the spiritually proud who turn to fake saviors to rescue them from the discomforts of life or to convince them that they are their own God in this life, never realizing how desperately they need saving grace. If you find yourself rejecting the idea of repenting and confessing Jesus as your Lord, if you find the call to die to yourself is kind of a bit harsh, if this whole Christianity thing is just an add-on, something you do on the occasional weekend every once in a while, then this is a wake-up call from Jesus. That that is not whom the kingdom of heaven is offered to. You're neither the God or the Savior of your life. And frankly, if you want to try to live your life without him, eventually God will say, okay, have it your way. Forever. You can get your way against God. Guys, this life that we're given here on earth is a wonderful grace period. It's a beautiful opportunity day after day, to receive God's grace. You, you are currently swimming in an ocean of grace. I mean, it is called your life right now. Don't go another day without humbling yourself and, and submitting your life, laying your life down to the Savior who's already paid your debt in full. On the other hand, if you find yourself absolutely desperate for a solution to your mess, if you want nothing more than than to be rescued from the hole that you've dug for yourself. If you're crying out for someone to come in and save you and rescue you and redeem you and adopt you into a new life, this is very good news. This is good news because this is God's invitation to to come in and experience the love that is lavish in His kingdom. What we see in the wonderful, tender, loving heart of God is that it is precisely... These people, those who are poor in spirit, who are destitute and consciously so of any spiritual worthiness they have, these are the people to whom God's kingdom is offered. God opens heaven's door to those who are spiritually poor. So how do you open heaven's door? How do you, how do you get heaven's door open? It's actually very hard to experience, but it's the process is simple. The process is very simple. Number one, recognize your spiritual poverty. Number two, Repent of your spiritual pride, your, your selfish pride. And number three, receive the Savior's pardon. Right? Put your faith and your trust in Jesus, that he died on the cross to forgive you of your sin, and also submit your life to him as the Lord. He's not an add-on to your life. He's in charge of it all. The overwhelming encouragement from every part of the Bible is to surrender to the one who has already paid your debt in full. Lay your life down. Give it up. Surrender it to him. This is very good news. It may seem harsh to those who want to cling to their life, who, those who do not want to let go of their selfish pride. But this is very good news to us today. It's very good news for the person who's come to the end of themselves and found the strong 
hand of the Savior stretched out to them. This is very good news for the exhausted and the empty person who's reached out to Jesus and received his grace. This is very good news for the guilty sinner who's admitted his own poverty of spirit before God and his inability to do anything about it. This is good news. Because the kingdom of heaven is offered to you. It's the spiritually poor. It's the spiritually poor. It's those who are poor in spirit who cry out for a savior. And when they do, they get more than saving. They get eternal life. They get adopted into God's royal family. They are sealed by God's Holy Spirit. It's, it's the spiritually poor who are redeemed and restored. It's the spiritually poor who are the focal point of God's attention. It's the spiritually poor who are given authority to rule and to reign with Christ. It, yes, this is very good news because God opens heaven's door to those who are spiritually poor. So lay your life down for the one who laid his life down for you. Jesus, I pray that your words would encourage or convict us appropriately. We have an absolute poverty of our spirit before you, but God, help us to be consciously aware of that. Help us to admit it. Help us to confess it. Help us to come before you in desperation, laying our lives down, totally surrendered to you, God. I pray that this experience here today, this, this church thing that we just do on Sundays would be more than that, that it would actually be life, that it would be an experience of knowing you and your body. God, draw us close to you. I pray that you would give us a desperation of spirit to need everything about you. Today, I pray that you would comfort the afflicted, and that you would also afflict the comfortable. And that in so doing, you would draw us closer to your heart in your kingdom.